Pros know how to use and make tools. In a paper published in the journal Scientific Reports, a team of researchers showed evidence that New Caledonian crows, which have been observed making several types of tools out of sticks, may be able to build tools from memory, even if they've only seen the tool itself and haven't ever seen the tool being constructed. So this might just look like a bird tearing up a piece of paper, but let's break down what's actually going on. Here the crow, named Emma, has learned that putting the bigger piece of paper into the slot will be rewarded with a treat. A behavior she learned through trial and error, which might not seem like a big deal or just a dumb pet trick, but this is just the beginning. Emma is now given a large sheet of paper, and as you can see, she begins to tear it into a smaller size that will fit in the slot, which is impressive. But keep watching. She then continues to alter the piece she ripped until it is almost exactly the same size as the piece that gave her the reward. Look at this side-by-side -side comparison. Hers is almost the exact same size as the one cut by a human, you know, with hands and scissors. What's even more impressive is Emma's ability to improvise as she has now been conditioned to get a reward for manufacturing a small piece of paper. Again, it's almost the exact same size as the human-made template. Check this out. Here's a crow solving an eight-part puzzle. Here's a crow learning about water displacement. We had to develop language and bathtubs before we figured that out. All of this is to say, crows are masters of tools and they can even form mental templates of tools based on other crows' tools and their own past tools. If we look at humans as an example, we have improved technologies over time by learning from each other and creating new iterations of inventions, even if we never saw the original inventor in action. After all, the designer of a new Ferrari doesn't need to see the very first horseless carriage in action to know how to make a better version. Speaking of cars, crows are so good at using tools that they sometimes use moving cars as nutcrackers. Here's a crow waiting patiently above a road, dropping a nut down on the pavement for a car to run over, and reaping the rewards without having to break a sweat. Which is actually good for crows, because they can't sweat. Crows keep themselves cool through evaporation, but it seems like it's only a matter of time before they invent crow air conditioning. Yes, spiders can fly. Take a look at this little guy. In this nightmare fuel of a video, the spider in question is using a technique called ballooning to achieve flight. Let me get out of the way so you can see. Ballooning, sometimes called kiting, is a process by which spiders and some other small invertebrates move through the air by releasing one or more gossamer threads to catch the wind, causing them to become airborne, seemingly at the mercy of air currents. Gossamer threads are fine, filmy substances spun by small spiders. This is primarily used by spiderlings to disperse. However, larger individuals have been observed doing so as well. The spider climbs to a high point and takes a stance with its abdomen to the sky, releasing fine silk threads from its spinneret until it becomes a loft. You know, like a balloon or a kite. Except those things are fun and this is terrifying. Spider flights have ranged from a few meters to hundreds of kilometers. So just stay out of the wind and you'll be safe from an airborne arachnid attack, right? A new study suggests that might not be the case. In fact, floating on the breeze isn't even these spiders' greatest trick because these creepy crawlies can fly without the wind. Ugh, that makes me feel so uncomfortable. So how can something fly without wings or wind? By harnessing the power of Earth's magnetic field to propel themselves through the air. Duh. Doctors Erica L. Morley and Daniel Robert of the University of Bristol found that when spiders are placed in a windless chamber with no breeze, but a small electric field, they were still able to fly. On, off. On, off. Pretty cool, right? Also, it is so irresponsible to tease a spider that can float. We don't want them to turn on us. Off. So how does it work? Let's break it down. Ballooning uses multiple strands of silk in a fan-like shape to catch the wind and float like a dandelion. Here, instead of tangling and meandering in light air currents, each silk strand is kept separate, most likely to facilitate a repelling electrostatic force. This spider is almost certainly using electricity to levitate. A team of researchers found that sensory hairs on spiders' bodies moved whenever an electric field was turned on. These hairs, known as trichobothria, stand up, much like human hairs do from static electricity, and signaled that a spider's takeoff was imminent. For a better understanding of the spider's behavior under electric fields, the scientists looked to bumblebees, whose mechanosensory hairs are also sensitive to electric fields. These early studies with electrostatic forces suggest 
that a spider's trichobothria is sensitive to electric fields and might be what incites its liftoff and airborne behavior. If Morley and Roberts' proposal that spiders can detect electric fields is proven, the spooky arachnids will be the second arthropod species after bees known to use electric fields at levels found under natural atmospheric conditions. And hey, I don't mind if spiders are suddenly scarier, because I've got a secret weapon. Off. How did dogs go from this to this? The answer is humans. We turn wolves into cuddly, incompetent little buddies. It's all evidenced in this dog versus wolf teamwork challenge. When two wolves are given the task of pulling a rope simultaneously to unlock food, they attack the problem like two predators. They have an almost scary level of coordination and immediately run to the rope, working as a cohesive unit to get whatever passes for wolf treats nowadays. Imagine if that rope was your arm. Now watch as the same puzzle is given to two dogs. They're much cuter, but holy smokes, are they terrible at working together. Look at that one wagging his tail. What are you doing, buddy? What have we done to you? If wolves have disputes with each other, they're down to fight it out to establish dominance. After the fight, however, wolves frequently reconcile, sometimes patching things up a minute after the fight happened. Because domestication has made it less necessary for dogs to rely on one another, they have a diminished need to cooperate and prefer to avoid rather than face a social problem head on. While wolves practice group hunting, cooperative territorial defense, and raise each other's young regardless of parentage, packs of dogs are mainly scavengers and known more for a flexible and more promiscuous mating system. Dogs are more interested in forming a relationship if the promise of food is involved. In a study conducted in Vienna at the Wolf Science Center, the scientists observed four captive wolf packs and four captive dog packs that lived in identical large enclosures. They recorded all growling, aggressive encounters and found that while the wolf packs engaged in 419 aggressive interactions, as opposed to only 55 aggressive dog interactions, the dog fights were much more intense. 86% of the dog conflicts were counted as high intensity aggressions, while only 59% of the wolf conflicts were classified as the same. Some dog fights got so intense that a few individuals had to be removed from their packs due to violence. All the wolves, however, kept things civil. Go to a dog park and you'll see how much humans have messed up canine society. You'll see dogs chasing each other in circles, fighting, and sitting on their owner's laps, refusing to interact with other dogs. Basically, humans have turned dogs into uncooperative pity wolves, which is a sad realization given how much everyone loves dogs. But then again, wolves will murder you and they'll do it as a group project. It appears that when humans became friends with dogs, it made inner doggy friendships less important. Good doggy communication became worse, and the less frequent communicative threats gave rise to more intense physical aggressions when conflicts occurred. Once they were friends with humans, fighting with and avoiding other dogs became the most frequently used tools in the doggy tool belt. As ancient civilizations began to use dogs for hunting and companionship, both the dog's DNA and behavior changed. That's good news for humans looking for a pal, but bad news for dogs who run into problems with their packs. Still, if we're talking companionship, this guy is much better than this guy. <laughs>